hello everyone and uh welcome to episode three of uh revolution uh i'm rob Furman. i'm here with my colleague uh keith reeves keith has had some uh, wonderful wonderful news this past week uh, his book insurrection uh has been picked up by a publisher and should be out soon and uh i'll give him an opportunity to talk about his book a little bit but I think the overarching theme of we need to change education for the better and for the betterment of the kids uh, is really the, uh, the the heart of what we're trying to do here with the video cast revolution as well. So I think his book will tie in so nicely with what we're trying to do here. Um, so today we're talking about a conspiracy theory, and 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 I have one, and I want to share it with you. <laughs> And, and my colleague, Keith, does not know what I'm going to say right now. So um, it's going to be interesting to see his reaction to some of this kind of stuff because I want to keep it fresh and I want to kind of get an open, honest opinion. So he had no time to, to look up any of these things that I'm going to mention, and we'll see how he reacts to this. Uh, my conspiracy theory is this. High-stakes testing and accountability for teachers has become a means for... Uh, the powers that be, whoever they may be, to destroy public education. I know that's a pretty big, big comment, but here, here are some of my thoughts, and here's what I've been seeing happening. Um, the Common Core Standards, which I actually find to be relatively a decent set of standards, um, but the way they were brought in was grossly inappropriate. Uh, instead of rolling them in, checking developmental appropriateness, for example, they're not developmentally appropriate for kindergartners, um, they just slammed them all on you. So if you were in third grade, you missed K1 and 2's worth of content that the Common Core would have had you prepared for those fourth grade uh, standards. So right off the bat, those kids were at a disadvantage. And then we bring in the word accountability. And it's really hard to argue with that word because we want everyone to be held accountable for what they're doing. And that's a really powerful word, but I think it's, it's gonna ride um, because the word of being accountable uh, can be dangerous and you have to hold the term accountability accountable for its definition and i think that's what we're not doing um so anyways we brought this standards in we have the accountability and we use high stake testings to create this uh accountability standard for teachers but then the powers that be create a moving target and in pennsylvania this happened where the cut scores or you know, the level of the minimum level that you have to reach in order to be considered proficient, advanced, and so forth were moved on us after the test was taken. So the test is taken, the powers that be didn't like the results, so they decided to start moving the cut scores, which ultimately made many schools in our state not look so good in terms of uh, the quality of that of that instruction. So brand new standards, kids, kids were now have Swiss cheese skills because they weren't started at the beginning. And we've got a test with a moving target for accountability. Now, take that and look at some states that have now created these powers that be, like, for example, Texas and Alabama. They made their new Department of Education heads, the, the Secretary of Education, people that don't believe in and don't like public education. One in particular, uh, the new president of the Secretary of Education in Texas is the former president of the Homeschooling Association obviously not a real fan of public education. Uh, in Alabama, they, they hired somebody who, who publicly says he would never send his kids to public education, has never sent his kids to public education, and is vocally against public education. So these two people are now our leaders that are creating this, this, um, these decisions in terms of cut scores and what is considered accountable and not. And then finally, you get Senate Bill 6, which is in Pennsylvania right now. It's also been established in other states. Um, that says, if your school does poor enough, we will take you over, we will fire the principal and half of your staff, we will put in our own staff, they do not have to be teacher certified, only 75% of them have to be teacher certified if the state puts them in, and if it still doesn't do well, we, will, we have the right to give your area over to charter schools, private schools, vouchers, and so forth. That's a loose interpretation of the Senate Bill 6, feel free to look it up on your own. So here's what we have. Leaders who do not like public education, creating a move it, moving target of accountability for kids and teachers, kids not doing well on these random random uh, uh, cutoff scores that, that are being sort of randomly chosen, 
in order for schools to look bad so that the powers that be can maybe take over, change, alter, or in effect, give over public education to privatization and, and or whatever else is out there. So that's my conspiracy theory and uh, loosely set up. And I'm going to give uh, Keith some time now to sort of see what he says on this and give his take on that. And then we'll we'll go back and forth a little bit. Keith? Just as in the movie The Matrix, the effort of the machines was to turn human beings into one of these. The standardized commercial testing complex is trying to turn the kids into one of these, right? The basic idea here is exactly as Rob just illustrated, and I took some notes here, and he's covered a lot of the ground that I cover in my book. This is exactly right as far as I'm concerned. The idea of standards is okay, but the effort here is not to standardize curriculum. The effort is to standardize kids by misperceiving and misunderstanding the nature of children. And I use the word love in the book. It's an unloving attitude to have towards children. Um, love is something that is, at least from the adult child perspective, it's something that is all encompassing. We want to see them as individuals and take care of all of their needs. That's the loving attitude towards children. Corporations and institutions, and I don't give a crap what Citizens United says, are not people. I don't care what rights they have. I understand that corporations as legal entities need to have, say, property ownership rights. But the idea of property and private when it comes to institutions can't be loving. It can't be humane by virtue of it being institutional. Standardizing kids makes them uh, widgets in the machine. It gives us an opportunity to make interchangeable parts and then try to lower the costs of those parts, including by bringing in non-professional educators, I say educators in quotes, in situations like uh, it sounds like SB6 uh, is bent toward. Um, and like all other mechanisms, be it SB6 or be it systems of accountability that are put in by these corporate autocrats, and I think that's to, to slightly tangent, when we say who who is the power that be, the Princeton study in 2014 showed with overwhelmingly convincing data that the American democracy is no longer functionally a democracy, it's an oligarchy. Power has been consolidated in a small number of extraordinarily wealthy individuals, usually people who are behind major corporations. Um, so people who are interested in oversimplifying major problems to very simple integer-based data can then apply those thoughts, those business-minded practices to children as if they're all the same. That's where the whole system of privatization for me breaks down. Business-minded mentality looks for efficiency. Education eschews the idea that efficiency is in any way important. Efficiency needs standardization. It needs to try to find ways that it can eliminate variables. Children, by their very nature, are constantly full of ever-changing variables. Educators know that. They perceive that. They not only recognize that, but celebrate that as essential, right? Kids have to be diverse. They have to have a variety of skills. They have to have a different set of different ways of being. Rob pointed out the developmental appropriateness of curriculum. You look at a kid in second grade simply by virtue of that kid continuing to respire, ingest food, and grow, that will be a fundamentally different person in third grade in sixth grade, age 18. Additionally, at the micro, that kid is gonna change on a day-to-day -day basis, on an hour-to-hour -hour basis. In some cases, particularly if you've taught elementary school like Rob and I have, on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. That's the nature of children. You can't standardize them. But the efforts to privatize, the effort to take these nonsensical ideas that use oversimplified data and apply them in a public school setting, be it through corporations who sell us products I won't name the major corporation, the British corporation that basically owns American public ed, but we all know who we're talking about. They own the GED, they own the SAT, they own, they own, they own, right? Or College Board as another institution where I'm not even necessarily suggesting that College Board is the one behind it, but people are using AP scores in the same way they're using standardized test scores to try to rank data, the US World News Report, the Challenge Index, all of these ideas, common core standards, these notions that you can standardize kids, fit them into pre-existing molds, take these corporate and business-minded attitudes and apply them to schools and fix the problem that's never worked. The whole second section of my book talks about the history of this thing. Since the very beginning of industrialization, this has been attempted, and it fails every time. Why? A fundamental misperception that kids are not these, they're not these, 
They're human beings. And that fundamental misperception allows business to do the kind of things that Rob's talking about. Buddy, I have a difficult time disagreeing with anything that you said. I think you got it. Well, certainly, you know, I, I feel that you and I have, have always been um, of, of the same mind. And I think that's why we do that. And it's okay. We don't have to disagree all the time. However, uh, for those of you that are that are that are watching this video, uh, there, there there is a comment section below, and if there's anything that we're saying that you do disagree with, uh, pl please create a conversation, and and Keith and I will be more than happy to respond. Uh, this this is just our ideas, and we want everybody's ideas to to sign to sort of mold together uh, what this all may mean for for education. And um, it's okay to disagree with us. We're actually we actually enjoy a, a good disagreement. Uh, and, and just remember to uh, to attack the concept, not the person, because that's what a good debate does. You attack the ideas, uh, not the people. Um, but but at the end of the day, we we, we want to hear what you have to say. Um, so with that in mind, I, I think that this is a good way to end this situation because I think we've cleared the field. Um, I, I would like to say that if you enjoy this type of conversation, watch for the book called Insurrection uh, by Keith Reeves. I'm sure it'll be on his website, which is, uh, I think it's kdreeves.com, right? You Keith? got it. That's right. Okay. Uh, kdreeves.com. It'll be out there. And um, I'm looking forward to reading the whole thing. And um, thank you very much for, for tuning in. This is uh, Rob Furman uh, saying goodbye. And don't forget to find me on Twitter at Dr. Furman. And I'll give Keith a chance to say goodbye as well here. Keith? That's Keith Reeves. You can uh, hit me up on my website at katyreeves.com or you can follow me on Twitter at ReevesKD. Thanks a lot.